To get to step one, step 12, and it's a long way, we started at the first step in our review. <clears throat> and the first step was the foundation of all of this, and, the, and before tonight in talking about the 12th step, we're going to get it right around, because this thing just goes right around from 1 to 12, and 12 back to 1. <clears throat> but we begin at the first step, the foundation of recovery was what is the problem? And as we said, this is, uh, I think it's the greatest thing on the face of the earth for an alcoholic uh, was Alcoholics Anonymous because Alcoholics Anonymous is about the only place where a drunk can find out what's wrong with it. You know, uh, uh, every place else go, every place else a drunk goes, they tell him what to do. <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous tells him what's wrong with him and then he'll know what to do. Come on. Uh, but uh, I didn't know what was wrong with me. And it was through, I was on a 12-step call, again, through another alcoholic. About the only way an alcoholic can find out where he is is through another alcoholic, you know. I could identify with this man. And, and I found out in the first step the exact nature of my problem. The first step says we're powerless over alcohol. And our lives have become unmanageable. And it talks about the two factors which make me powerless. I had a physical allergy to alcohol. I was an abnormal drinker. They called me a lot of other things, but really that's what I was. <laughs> I like what a guy says, that's a nice word for what they used to call me. Yeah. When I was an abnormal drinker, I did not drink like so-called normal tempered drinkers. When I took a drink, something occurred within me that did not occur in these people. Because I, had, I, had a, I was allergic to alcohol. When I took a drink, you know, I had a, a phenomenon of craving. I had a craving of alcohol. And this craving, was, <clears throat> this craving was a manifestation of this allergy. When I took a drink, this craving would start, and the doctor said I would go through the well-known spree. And, and once I took a drink I, all, all my life, I can't remember ever taking a drink without immediately wanting another drink, and another drink, and another drink, and another drink. And this is still what amazes, amazes me about social drinkers today, that they do not really, they don't crave alcohol. They take one and they may, they can, they may not take another one, but they don't want no more. In fact, they, you know, they tell us when they take a drink, it really makes them, after a couple of drinks, it becomes nauseous to them. It makes them kind of dizzy, and it gives them a sense of being out of control. And it's really an uncomfortable feeling, and that's the way you should feel if you put some bad stuff in you like alcohol. Because alcohol is a toxic drug. And the body normally has a, lets us know when it don't like what we put in it. But the alcoholic's body, uh, like a guy I know of in North Carolina, he says, he said, everybody's got an alcohol strainer. You know, every, everybody come, is made, when they come here on the face of this earth, they got equipment to strain alcohol out, except the alcoholic and his is busted. We have a busted strainer. <laughs> and once I take a, a drink of alcohol, I do not feel nauseous and dizzy and out of control. When I take a drink of alcohol, I get a, a, a lift. When I take a drink of alcohol, I'll get a sense of being in control. And immediately I have a craving for a second drink. So I reach over and take another drink. And when I take that second drink, I, I, put, I put two in there, now it's double. So I crave harder. So I take another one and another one and another one. I go through the well-known spree and get in a lot of trouble, drink too much, I embarrass myself, I do something. I always did something from the very first drink, very first night. I just I went beyond what I what I would have done in every time in my life, and I would emerge like every alcoholic down at the bar when I quit drinking. I said I will never do that again, but that wasn't my main problem. My main problem was in my mind. I had a mental obsession. See, alcohol did something for me that it didn't do for those people. Uh, I had this uh, 
all my life. The doctor says I was restless and irritable and discontent. You know, I, I just didn't fit in. I just didn't feel just as good about myself as I seem to be. Always there was something missing in my life. And somewhere along the early, when I was about 18 years old, I took this first drink. You know, things came together. I remember that night very vividly. That's what the doctor said. I remember my first drink. I don't know, that's not a prerequisite to being alcoholic. But I don't remember my first uh, banana split. <laughs> didn't, it didn't do nothing for me. I don't remember my first Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper, a pork chop. <laughs> I don't remember none of those. But I remember my first drink. I remember the people I was with, what brand it was, where it was at, and I remember it. So the doctor says, we remember the sense and ease and comfort that came at once by taking a few drinks of alcohol. And I, when I, so it, it must have meant something to me. When I took those few drinks, this is the thing that, that, that stuck in my mind and was burned into my mind. And you know, it was so strong that, that even with all the pain and suffering I went through and the humiliation from alcohol, after coming off of one of those things and after getting into trouble and all these situations, I, the, this sense of ease and comfort that alcohol gave me I remember that stronger than I did all the pain. I mean, it was so strong that it would push out all the pain. Years and years of pain. And the only thing I could think of was this sense of ease and comfort. And so I would believe that lie, and this was what would make me take that first drink. And once I put that first drink in my system, it set off the phenomenal craving, and I was in a lot of trouble. So long as I had that in my mind, I was powerless over alcohol. The main problem of, was in my mind, this obsession, remembering that sense of needs and comfort. So once we, once we have these two things make us powerless over alcohol. The second step is very simple, and it's based on the first step. You know, if we are powerless, the solution is power. And obviously, this power would have to work in the mind. We, can't, we can live with the allergy. So therefore, the second step came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And we, if it, we could remove this obsession, if we, didn't, we weren't restless and urban discontent, we would never think about this, about this sense and ease and comfort because we would be already comfortable. So the second step talks about we believe this is the solution to this problem. And then we come to the real program of recovery. You know, once we do this, this is a foundation, and, and if every alcoholic can get to this point, he hasn't done anything at this time, but he's the first time he can see where he's at, step one is what's going on with him, and he has a solution. Now, the main thing now is to find this power. You know, if you're powerless over here, and the solution is power, then the main job is, well, let's find this power. How do we find this power? This is the main purpose of the book and the program is to enable us to find a power greater than ourselves which will solve our problems. So the first step in finding this thing is a decision. All action begins with decision. And he says, you know, if we have a decision, we can decide, we can make, got to, we got to look at these things and decide, do we want to be powerless or do we want this power? We have to decide between these things. And we make a decision, if it's, we make a decision, all of us will choose the power. And if we choose this, then we have to give up certain things. You know, we have to give up our will. You know, we alcoholics have got a lot of that. You know, that's one thing about alcoholism, that to recover from alcoholism, we got to give up probably the two things that we love the most. Number one is alcohol, and number two is self-will. Boy, those are, that's tough. That's a tough decision. So we make a decision here to turn over our will, and this is simply our directions of our lives, over the care of God as we understand him. And then we go to work to do this. There are certain works got to be done, so we have the, the action steps, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, these are the action steps that carry out the decision. And as we said earlier, 
you know, we alcoholics are, are, are self will run right, our book says. There are certain things that within us that block us off from God. Our book, uh, kind of, throughout, it talks about this thing is within us. God is within man. All great philosophers talk about that. Deep down in every man, woman, and child is a fundamental conception of God. Many years ago, a man said the, the kingdom is God is within man. All, all philosophers talk, we have some guidance, we have some directions, and we know how to live. I'm, I've never seen an alcoholic that didn't know how to live. He didn't know right from wrong. But he simply seemed like he couldn't get it to work. Now, I always didn't know what to do. And the only time I used it was after the fact. <laughs> you know, the next morning I said, doggone it, you know you shouldn't have done that. That was the story of my life. You know what I mean? But I just couldn't live with it up front. It was there. But it was covered up. You know, it was covered up by calamity, by pomp, by worship, by other things. By worldly things and my emotions. But it was always there. So step four is all about carrying out the decision. If I wanted God to to direct my life. There are certain things within me that I have to get rid of. And step four is all about inventory and analyzing these things. And, I, and he talked about, we went through with resentments. And I saw how these things dominated my life. And I saw how these things uh, controlled and run my life on a daily basis. I talked about uh, fears. We talked about our sex conduct of the past. And we listed and analyzed those things. In step five, we, were, we learned more about them by discussing them with a, another human being, with God and ourselves, another human being. And it improved on the information that we got in step four. And once we got these things out and looked at them and seen the damage and effect of our lives and how they were blocking us, then in step six, we become willing to get rid of them. And in step seven, we ask God to remove them. So in these four steps, we went to work on ourselves. And then the next phase of steps, talks, 89, talks about our relationship with others. These are things, too, that have grown out of self, the damage of the past. So in 8 and 9, we worked on our relationship with others. And then in step 10, we went back and continued to work on, the, on our, our relationship with God. We continued to work on ourselves. We continue to work on our relationship with others. And we, we went back in the process of step 10 and continued to clean up all three general areas. Once we got these things out of the way and these things that blocked us from God, then in step 11, we were able to receive God into our lives. We were able for the first time to, to, to carry out the decision in step 3. You know, the whole, we said the whole steps were about three, making a decision to turn over our will, clearing out the things that block us with these steps. And then in step 11, we, step 11, we receive God's will. So it's a changing of directions, from self-directions to God's direction. So step 11 is really the final part, and this is, this is the ultimate area that we come to. Now 12 comes right after leaven, having had. If you had leaven, if you are able to receive God's direction, you have had a, a spiritual experience. But then step 12 tonight says, you know, having had this, now we give it away. Now we have something to give. And I think this is the, you know, the real strength of a, a, probably one of the most most vital steps in my life, I said, of all these steps, which are all giving steps, they are things that bring to your life. Possibly one of the most single things that have affected my life is, is the 12th step. That, that actually we grow more through giving than we do through receiving in the first 11. The 12th step is a very big growth step. We grow through giving. And I know when I first come to AA, hey, this is a, I didn't know well, all of this sounds funny. If you're here tonight and first time, it's how are you going to grow through giving something away? You know I mean? But it's been said many times, you know, many thousand years ago, a man said it's more blessed to give than to receive. You know, it's more blessed to give with the 12th step 
than to receive through all the leaven that we do grow through giving. Now the 12 step is a, is a very precise step in the big book and reason to I don't know why Bill, I guess he knew the foundation of AA depended on that because it wasn't but a 100 people to begin with and we can see the power of that of the millions of million or so people that are sober as a result of 100 people starting the 12th step. And um, the 12th step is very specific. You know, we read it off and uh, I... Um, Sometimes we run through it real fast and we don't hear it being read. I like to specifically be to, to, to look at it and, and when we talk about it and get all the words and see what he's saying. He says, having had a spiritual awakening, he says, as the results of these steps. You know, it, it's there. He didn't say a results. He said, as the results. So, that means that the 11 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't give you but one, one thing, the results. A spiritual awakening. You know, and we've said as we went through that, you know, that was a, a personality change sufficient to recover from alcoholism. And if you have a personality change sufficient to recover from alcoholism, uh, you don't have to not drink anymore. You know, you're not the same person. You're not the person you were. You have had a change in your life. And Bill said a spiritual experience is very simple. You know I mean? It's no big deal. He said when you can believe, when you can think, when you can feel and you can do things that you couldn't do on your, on your own unaided. And that's very simple. You know? And I think it's quite obvious. You know, people say, well, you know, I, I, can, I can feel things that I couldn't feel before. I can feel love. I mean, before I used to think it was coming in heat you know but I can feel love I can, I can feel concern for another person many many things that I couldn't feel before I, I don't believe the same I used to believe God kept score on you <laughs> you know what I mean and when, he, when you got uh, like I did so far behind he just said well <laughs> you out of the game you know <laughs> I used to believe that. Well, I used to believe many of these things. Um, I can do things that I couldn't do before. Obviously. Well, the main one, I can stay sober. So, step 12 is the ultimate step. You know, all of these steps are steps in which we take. Bring things to you. All you got to do is work them, and they just, you don't do nothing. The first 11 steps are, are brings, bring, brings all these good things into your life. The 11 steps are all things that we take. We, you know, when we first come in, we, we're just like babies. These are just, the, they just give to us. You know? We don't have to do nothing. We work the steps, and the steps bring these things into our life. The 12th step <clears throat> is a step in which we give. The 11 receive, and through the 12, the 12th one, we give. You know, we receive from, from the first 11, and then the 12th, having had, then we can give. You know, many years ago, it was a, a man said that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. We get more blessings from giving. And so it all hinges on this 12th, and really the 12th, as we say, when we get down to it and look at it, it's got a lot to do with the first step. You know, the first step, we, we, we saw where we were and we got the answer. And I saw where I was through another alcoholic. And in step two, it says we come to believe, and once we come to believe, that's the beginning. And once we believe, we have to make a decision in step three. And once the decision, we have to take some actions which is four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And once we work those steps, we get the promises of the book. We get the promises on page 83 and 84 and 84 and 85. And once these promises are fulfilled, then we know the program works. And the 12th step is saying, if you know the program works, if you have gotten results, 
if you have had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, then you know it works. You don't believe. You used to believe it's step two. But if it works, then you know it works. You have faith. And the one who knows, that's the 12th step person, wants you to get to 12 steps, then you know. Now what you know, you are supposed to carry it back to the new man. And he can look at you, and you can't help him know. But by looking at you, he can begin to believe. And he can get started. This is the way I, I started. You know, there was a guy named Charles, and, and I remember it was uh, almost 25 years ago. I wa he walked into, he, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous came to me. I was... Uh, in a position where I couldn't get to it, I was locked up. <clears throat> and I was locked up in this nut house and bars on the windows of about 80 other nuts. And uh, so Alcoholics Anonymous came to me. And this guy came in there that night, and I remember I always tell about it, and I went to my first AA meeting because the little guy had been nice to me and, and God uses strange people to work in our life. You know, it isn't the high and the mighty and the learned. it. Well, he, he didn't choose those kind of people. This guy uh, let me sit around about two days before he said anything to me. But I finally found out what was going on in this instance, in this place and why they didn't talk to you too much and why, you know, because See, they were all, all these nuts was in there. Now, what happened, see, all, if you ask one of them nuts what he was doing in there, all the nuts said they were alcoholics. Well, I'm an alcoholic. It's the only place I have ever been before or since where alcoholism was a status symbol. On this, on this board, it was a, you was, you know, but all the, all, what happened, see, we alcoholics got good treatment on the ward. The mental patients never got, you know, nobody really cared anything about the mental patients. There was about 75 mental patients in there. And some of these people had been there, there was one man that had been there actually since he was six years old and he was 36. And that was his life in there. Uh, in fact, I still see him when I go to that hospital on the, on the grounds at Benton Unit. He'd been there all his life. There were many people like that at this time, and this was all they knew. This was their home, and this all they knew. Now, we alcoholics didn't stay for 30 days in those days, and it really wasn't, they didn't do anything to us. They didn't, wasn't much of a treatment. But they, uh, we got good treatment. We had visitors. The aides would talk to us, and they treated us different than they did the mental people. So, the mental people saw this, and uh, when you ask one of them in there, they say, I'm an alcoholic. See, they wanted to be in the class. They wanted to be big shots like us. <laughs> now, we alcoholics, when you asked us what was wrong with us, we said nervous breakdowns. You know, you, know, you couldn't tell who. <laughs> you know. But I said, hey, I, I talk, I've talked about this a lot of times, and it really, it, it does. It gets to me to to think, you know, about how God works in the human life. And what about the 12th step? It's the most important thing in my life. That Monday morning, I got in there on Saturday, that Monday morning, a little, a little patient, one of the alcoholics on the ward, and I love the work of, I, I love Paul. Aura was my my 12 step man. Or I wasn't a learned man in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I think most of us think, well, I gotta meet somebody in a the leader of AA, which we don't have, by the way. You know, I wanted the leader. You know, I wanted the expert. But I didn't get him. <laughs> my approach to Alcoholics Anonymous, my first contact to Alcoholics Anonymous was a mental patient on the ward. He had about Two weeks of locked up so bright in there. <laughs> he had the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. 
And it had a carton of caramel cigarettes. <laughs> and you know what got me. You know, I was, I had 50 cents when I got there. And this guy had a, and I blew it on one pack of cigarettes and a couple of candy bars. I believe cigarettes was 30 cents in those days. And this guy sat down beside me that morning with a, with a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and a carton. And I, he didn't have a carton, but I seen him going in there getting them from the aid out of his carton. Now nobody on our on this ward had a had a had a, a even a pack of cigarettes. Now I love the work of Paul. You know, Paul says God's grace is sufficient. And that's about what God is in our life. God ain't no big deal. God in the human life is just enough every day. See, he's got a lot of folks to take care of. And oil was enough for me. You know, I didn't have need need no learned person. Or I had the book, had a carton to count with cigarettes, and reading these tracks me because they had these cigarettes. And I didn't have any smokes, you know. Uh, I talk about your life is unmanageable. I can see how unmanageable my life was. Here I am there, broke, no cigarettes. They give me some roll your own tobacco. Boy, you ought to see me in there wrestling with that stuff. <laughs> Just coming off a of drug and I'm shaking it. <laughs> And I never rolled one in my life anyway. You never rolled a cigarette in my life. One a cigarette so bad. And here I am doing this and get it all wet and fall down. To it. Fall in my lap. The only way I, and, and talk about un, the manageability. The only way I could smoke was take my tobacco and paper and give it to one of them nuts and let him roll it and lick it and give it back to him. <laughs> And here this guy got a whole carton, man, sitting there, and the big book. And he comes up to me, and we get him to talk. And he, he talks about, for many years, I used to say, Oro talked to me about, we talked about the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, but we didn't. Oro didn't know anything about it. I sure didn't know anything about it. Oro had probably been to two meetings. But I think it's so important to me tonight and to and for the rest of my life in some way to live the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, we are living examples whether we, we think it or not in our community. We are, we are living big books. You know, and that's why it's important because there might be somebody out there. We might be, our lives might be an example to, to somebody. Because that's why I'm here tonight because there was a guy, a man that was living the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he was coming to the hospital every every Wednesday night. And Oral didn't talk about the big book. Oral talked about this man. Oral talked about him incessantly to me for three days. He told me all about it. And that Wednesday night, um, this is when things, when I went to my first meeting. I went to my meeting because Oral had been nice to me. And this is where these guys came and, and what they did basically is just like the book said. These guys come in there and they I expect them to, to meddle in my business, you know, usually do-gooders. I thought they was do-gooders. They say, you need to do this, you need to do that, and you need to do that. But this guy come in real nice and got up there, and all three of them started talking about their own lives. You know, that's the funny thing. That's what a 12-step call is. When we go to a new alcoholic, we sit down, and they did it real good that night. We tell him our story. We tell him our experience. Which the book says, start, find, the book says, see your man alone, learn something about him. And when you sit down with him, begin to tell him about your alcoholism. Tell him how baffled you were. Tell him about the problems in your life. That's what a 12-step call is all about. See, because that, uh, that drunk is lost. This I, looks like I was lost 25 years ago. I was lost. And these guys sat down and told me their story. And when they told me their story, I was able to find myself in them. They just laid down their lives. They said the greatest gift that an individual is given is one who lays down his life for another. Not physically, but you lay down your experience, your problems. And because if they had did it, I would have never been able to find, I was so mixed up and so lost, but I never would have found where I was. I never would have seen the first step, but I saw my first step through them. He did exactly like the book says, do it. So let him ask you, what did you do? And this guy talked to, 
and we go out on a 12-step call, it's, it's all about, and say another, if there's another alcoholic anywhere tonight, off, there's one here, and he's lost. I mean, he's lost in his life, he's lost just like I was, he's lost in the, in the problem of alcoholism, he's lost in the confusion of alcoholism. And the only way he's going to ever find himself is, is find another point of identification. How do you find, how, how can you, if you're lost, how do you, if you got to have something to identify with? And this man walked in there and he told his story. He told me about his life. He told me about his predicament. He talked insensitive about where he was, what trouble he was in his life. And it sounded like mine. I said, man, for the first, that guy is, I, I'm just like that guy. He, I was able to tie on to something. You know, I was just like throwing out a lifeline. I was able for the first time in all this confusion. And this guy told his story. He, and that's what, it, what we do on a 12-step call. Is we talk about, on a 12-step call, we talk about our powerlessness over alcoholism. We talk about our first step. That's right. You know, I went there, I was mad, like most of them. I was mad, you know, I, I don't want to go to this old damn old meeting. What time is it over? Hear me. <laughs> Somebody here nice think the same thing. <laughs> what time does it start? What time is it over, you know? And this guy got up there and I said, if he's going to meddle in my business, I know they're going to, you know, every, all do good. As you know, I had him picked. I didn't know a thing about AA, but I thought it would be like, I figured it out something like the plain clothes Salvation Army. The same thing, didn't have no uniform, but the same kind of outfit. They're gonna come in there and tell you what to do. So this guy come in there and he didn't he talked about himself. He talked about himself so much that night that when he he caught my ear. I was able to identify with him and my attitude began to change and I went over and asked him, I said, What do you think I should do? And boy, I remember he looked down at me, he said, I don't give a damn what you do. <laughs> He said, I'm telling you what I did. And I think this is, you know, this is what really turned me on about this. You know, I don't talk about that a lot, but you know, the guy that, that had the cigarettes, the guy that was there, kind of difficult at the time, but the guy that was there, the guy, the little guy had the cigarettes, the little guy that sat down and gave me cigarettes and, and, and talked to me about these guys from Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, this guy never was able to stay sober. Stayed sober six months, and he got drunk. This was in 1962 or 1965 when the Benton Detox Center opened up. I remember when it opened. Uh, uh, it was open a little while, and, and they brought this little guy to the detox center, the same guy. Uh, he never, he was sick, and they called me to go down there to see him, and I had maybe two and a half years or three years of sobriety, and I went down to visit with him. On several occasions after that, three or four years, he would end up in the detox center again, and I would go down to see him. Uh, once I was at, went to his home down in the southern part of the state to visit with him. Uh, about eight or nine years after that, when the Serenity House was first opened at the old Serenity House, a guy came to me one day and he said, here's uh, a friend of yours needs some help. And I said, who is it? And he said, it's Aura. And I went out there in the back of a car. It's, he, this was this guy laying in there, and he didn't, he didn't even resemble the same person that, that I'd known 10 years ago. But that was a guy who brought me the message. Uh, about less than three or four months after that, he went around the curve in an automobile, and he was killed. This guy never got the message he brought me. So, but, you know, so our responsibility is not to see that the message works. We do no, only we can only recover through a spiritual experience, and that's beyond our power. We're not healers. We don't have the responsibility to choose. And I'm glad we don't. If we could heal a person, we'd say, I'm gonna fix this one over here. And if we had the responsibility to choose who gets this message, I probably wouldn't be here. Because I don't think I would have been chosen. And maybe you wouldn't have been here. Maybe you wouldn't have been chosen. So our responsibility is to carry this message to other alcoholics and, and to let the message take care of itself. You know, uh, if it takes, okay. My book says if the person wants it, 
Uh, help him. If he don't want it, leave him alone. I'm sure you can find somebody else. Come here. You know, we're not supposed to force this on anybody. We're not supposed to pry into people's lives. Our job is simply to care. Our responsibility is carry this message. And we grow through giving, whether, they, whether, whether it works, or whether it takes, or whether it helps another individual. It doesn't matter. We grow through giving. But once you find one, learn something about his background, how to approach him, and say, tell, tell him about your drinking first. You know, that's, tell him about your experience with alcohol. Tell him how you were, you know, how baffled you were. Tell him about this, uh, this, this, this allergy to alcohol. And then tell him about, you know, your, your mind. Tell him how, how you tried to stop and how you failed. And let the man identify with all these little things in your life. Then after he says, after you do that, he said, then tell him what your solution is. And this is about the only thing that we do on a 12-step call. And as an alcoholic, about the only thing I can do is, is do that. I can, I can share my experiences. I can share my experiences with the problems with alcohol. And then I can tell the person, if he's interested, what my answer was. And if he's interested in this, then I can walk with him through this plan program of action. This is what, I, if we read our book, it tells us about 12 step. It tells us what sponsorship is all about. It tells us how to work with other alcoholics. In this verse, we work with other alcoholics the same way we recovered with this program. We show them what their problem is. We show them what the solution is. And then we walk with them through this plan program of action. It's a very simple thing to do. We should be familiar with it because we have applied it to our lives and, and we have the answers. You know, we, we, we have the answers to alcoholism. We have the answers to alcohol. We have experienced alcoholism. We're the only people on the face of this earth. You know, we hear about all these people. You can see a lot of it on TV about do this, do this, do this. This will help you, this will help you. Boy, I'm telling you, I mean, they didn't have those things. I'm glad it didn't happen when I was around. It confused the hell out of you. But we, in Alcoholics Anonymous, regardless of what anybody says, and we have no, uh, we're not in competition with anybody, but we in Alcoholics Anonymous are the only people in the world who have experienced alcoholism and recovered from it. We are. We are the only people in the world who have experienced alcoholism and recover from it. So we have a vital message. Come on. A vital message for the world. Come on. All of us have a purpose in life. You know, God created everybody in here for a purpose. You know, our creator created our creator didn't create us for us. He created us for his purpose. And I think everybody the happiest we're going to ever be in life is when we find, you know, why were we created? What purpose are we to serve in life? Yeah. Yeah. I think oil was a purpose in my life. And I think one of the most important things in my life that, you know, to be able to sometimes feel like that I'm fulfilling my purpose. You know, and this, this gives some... Uh, some purpose to my alcoholism. Maybe this is why I suffered alcoholism. Maybe this is why I recovered. Mm -hmm. to, to help other people. To carry this message to other people. And the more we, as we fulfill our purpose, you know, the more rewarding our life gets. You know, it, it talks about it in the big, big book. It talks about this, this light. You know, if our candle is lit, then we put it under a bushel. And, and do we this, this is not just a, a light itself it's enlightenment this, in, this light can light up another life for another person that's lost and I think that's just our responsibility having, having to walk into, into this light that we pass this light some way to another individual uh, and that sometimes you know we return and, and uh and some of us say, you know, to say thank you. You know, this is really, this is a gift. You know, 
I think God was good enough to work in my life to give me this, this new way of life. And, and this is my responsibility. You know, God don't want nothing I could, and he never, you know, I used to say, if you do this, I do that. He don't make no deals because he didn't ever need nothing I had. He didn't need nothing I had. But he's saying, though, if you appreciate what I have given you, if you really appreciate what I'm giving you, don't do it for me. I don't need anything yet. Give it to another person. This is the 12th step. But I think through God's grace, a gift unwarranted. Well, we were not chosen, but we were given this thing. And our job in the 12th step is to carry this message, this message that I have recovered as a result of these steps. This is the message we carry to other alcoholics. Now, you know, I, I made a lot of mistakes that we all do with all these steps in the 12 steps. You know, the 12 steps is so much about starting the guy on the first step, showing him where he is. For many years, the first few years I come to the program, I, I started drunk out on the third step. <laughs> I'd go to him and say, you need God, man. <laughs> Poor guy, you didn't even know what the matter with him, you know. Some of, them, some of them I started out on the inventory. <laughs> but we have a precise way of doing this. Give that person a chance. Give him, you know, Bill. Bill made this mistake. Bill, Bill made this mistake, and he, you know, we followed the same path. Bill had this vital spiritual experience in his life. Man, he, it was such a, it is, it was such a part, it is an overwhelming thing to find change in your life. So he, he immediately left the hospital and for six months he was running all over New York talking to drunks, trying to give them this great experience he had. Trying to give them his recovery program. Just before going to Akron, he happened to be down to Towns Hospital and Dr. Silkworth called him in one day. And talking to Dr. Silkworth, you know, Bill didn't have any, have any plan to what he was doing. He said, Bill, why don't you quit talking to them drunks about your Recovery. Why don't you quit talking to them drunks about your spiritual experience? Why don't you quit talking to these new people about this great thing you had? And why don't you start telling them what I told you about what is their problem, their illness? Start, maybe if you showed them what they were, where they are, if you told them what was wrong with them, then maybe they would buy into your program. So this is why on a 12-step call, you know, we talk, we're talking to a person that's lost. We're talking to a person that's confused. He's talking to a person who's trying to identify with something. So the first step is the beginning. And we're laying the foundation for everything we're going to do with a new person. And I thank God that my sponsor that night, when he walked in there that night, he was, it was a classic to me. Because I was able to see where he was. And the final on the twelfth on the last and final part of the twelfth step, it says that that we practice these principles in all our affairs. You know, and over in our book, after it wrote the twelve steps are wrote out, it talks about there that uh, these are these these are, these are principles. The pr after the steps, it talks about the principles. They are guides to progress. The principles we are set down are guides to progress. So the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous are a set of principles. These are the principles that we practice in all our affairs. Now after all, if they, they worked on the worst problem in our lives, why not use them on other things? The, principle, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, as Bill said, they are old as mankind himself. The principles uh, are, are, can be found in any great living program. There's nothing new. No, there are no new, new principles to the way a man should live. And in fact, you know, if we come back uh, on the face of this earth two or three thousand years from now and men are still here, the principle of living is going to be the same. You know, it's a principle is something that don't change. Like what goes up is going to come down. It's been doing that for thousands of years. <laughs> and it always goes, goes up, it's going to come down. A principle is really... Uh, a law that it seemed to have been acted by something greater than us. 
right? Laws by a power greater than ourselves. We, 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 live, we see these principles, and they never change. Now, so there is a design to the living. There is a design to, to everything that we do. There is a design to everything on the face of this earth. And we usually, uh, it's a funny thing how we usually know these things and apply them in, our, in all areas of our life except to living. Everything on this earth has a design to it. And that's what our book says. Our book has given us a design of living. You know, as we said throughout, you know, the first thing is to get the inside together. One, two, and three. Uh, the spiritual life. Four, five, six, and seven is the mind. Eight and nine is our relationship with others. We, there's a design to life. And once we, once we can live by this design and live within this design and function as human beings should function, then we will have, we will have peace. We will have serenity. We will have a comfortable, happy life. If we live our lives as they were designed. You know, but it, what, what my trouble was, I, I lived beyond my, my capabilities. I tried to run the show myself. But our book, everything has a, a, a limitation to it. Everything has a design. And that was my problem. I, I didn't have any principles. No one ever showed me how to live in my life. And I, I come from a great family, and I was around a lot of great people, and I was exposed to some people, some well-meaning people in my life. All of them tried for some reason. Now, I went to school. I went to college. So. And I, I went to many, many different places. I around a lot of great people. Everybody tried. They all talked. I remember listening to all that stuff. Some of it I didn't like. God, I mean. Everybody told me a lot of things in my life. Alcoholics Anonymous is the first group of people who ever told me how to live. They gave me the directions for living. And that's what the principles are, directions. They said, hey, here's how you live. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Then say, if you get it, carry it to somebody else and show him how to live. Yeah. Just that simple. All those years, no one told me how to do it. Now, the rest of them went about it a different way. <laughs> they didn't show me how to live. They gave me the rules. But you know, there's a whole lot of difference with you than the principles and rules. Uh, when you ain't got the principles, you'll break all the rules. <laughs> and that was my trouble. With rules and me had it. I mean, I hated rules. But I found out once the people at Alcoholics Anonymous gave me the directions, I ain't had a lot of problems with the rules. So, so the principles are really the directions or the laws to live by. These are the laws in which man should live by. And there, there are directions that come with everything. Like I say, everything on earth has. If you go to buy something, you open up the product. When you open the box, they got a lot of paper in the box. And you probably have to put it together too. <laughs> but somewhere in that box, you're going to find a little white slip of paper with some little instructions. Say, you know, tell you how to use this thing you just bought. And if you will, which many of us don't, but if you would take that out and read it, <laughs> you know what I mean? If you would read that thing, take time out and read it, it might sound stupid. And I know you're smarter than that. I, you know, I'm always smarter than them things than people put in them things. <laughs> and they look kind of dumb. But if you read them and apply them to that thing as you use it, you know it'll last longer. <clears throat> You'll get better service out of it. And they are even, and if you send it back in, they are even giving you warranty on it if you use it like they told you to. Of course, if you use it like you told it to, you probably ain't going to need nothing back. Now, everything on earth has a set of directions of how to use. Surely, you know, man, we are the most, we are the highest, and there is a set of directions for man to use his life. And that's what these principles are. And they haven't been hidden. They're in the Bible. 
There are many great living books. And they are all the same. Now the wording might be different. You know I mean? uh, it might sound different. But the way to live. There is but one way to live. And surely if we, if we follow these directions. And apply them in our lives. And live our lives the way God designed us to then we will have peace and contentment and all the great things that we're looking for in life. And, and surely, by God, surely we won't be restless and irritable and discontent and have to drink alcohol in order to live. Anybody that's drinking alcohol or taking drugs, you know, to live is not following directions. He's not using his life within the design. And just as the thing we buy, you know, each, each, each thing we buy has a directions in it. The directions are always written by the creed of the product. You know, if you buy something from General Electric, the General Electric writes out the principles and puts it in the box. You know, God made man. And he, he put these principles, he, and he wrote the principles for living. And he put them in, in a lot of great philosophies and a lot of great, a lot of great movements. They have been on the face of this earth. And they put them into the, pro, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think the greatest thing that, that what AA gives, it gives us a design and the directions to live by. And, and we still have the opportunity. Surely we give everybody the right. You can steal that. You can, you, you can use them. They're free. If someone here tonight, these are directions you hear, and AA has these things to offer. And if you want to do it your way, you're free to do that. You're free to do that. You know, I think one of the, the greatest things that's, uh, of the 12th step is the great powers of it is that we grow through giving. You know, that, as we said, the greatest growth is to lay down your life for another human being. And then we get more through giving than we do we receiving. I think that as we do this, we grow and grow continuously. And our book says that we hope you won't want to miss this. And I think it's one of the great wonders of my life and the great experience of Alcoholics Anonymous is to see, it says, to watch, uh, you know, to watch loneliness fade in an individual's life through the 12th step, through the person you work with, to watch this loneliness fade and to watch him get up himself you know, and watch him help other people. I'm sure that this is something you don't want to miss. And I think this is a great part of growth and to watch the fellowship grow up as it has here. And, and watch these people help other people. And to watch these things change. This has been really the wonders of my life. And surely one of the wonders of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we complete the 12 step tonight. Next week we'll go back again. Just like the 12 steps do. And we finish the 12 step. We'll go back and begin the first step. What is the problem? So next week we'll begin with step one.